um, scan algebras from higher genus mirror symmetry. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity to, to give a talk. So we'll start by two or three slides of general introduction, which maybe requires some knowledge. But then after that, I will go back to some completely elementary topic for the, at least the first part of, of the talk. So I will talk about some uh, recent work that appeared on some paper, which is essentially some extended application of some quantum mirror construction. So the general setting is mirror symmetry. So as we saw essentially in, for example, the three, three talks yesterday, given a log Calabio variety, it's a log Calabio pair YD, then taking as input genus zero log chromophyta invariance, let's say some algebra geometric version of counts of Maslow index zero disks, you should be able to construct a commutative associative algebra, which should be the algebra of regular function on the mirror. And in dimension two, such algebra geometric construction has been done by Gross, Eck, and Kill, and in higher dimensions by Gross and Siebert, and with some um, assumption by Kill and you. So my starting point would be some quantum mirror construction in which you replace counts of Maslow zero holomorphic disk by the higher genus analog, at least in dimension two. So we'll consider log Calabio surface YD in such a case, it's possible to deform the genus zero construction by taking into account higher genus curves. And then what you produce is some associative algebra, which is in general, no longer commutative. And this non-commutative algebra is a deformation of the commutative algebra that you get using genus zero invariance. So, uh, Slightly more concretely, in the usual story, you glue C star squared or copy of C star squared. And in the story I'm describing in this quantum mirror story, what you glue are quantum version of C star squared. So rather than to have the algebra of Laurent polynomials in two variables X and Y, you have some associative algebra generated by X and Y, which satisfies the relation X, Y equal Q, Y, X, where Q is a deformation parameter. And the general theme of this talk is that sometimes this quantum mirror construction recovers interesting associative algebras, which were originally described in completely different ways. And sometimes this construction, which again is based on enumerative geometry on count of iogenous solomorphic curves, provides new insights about these associative algebras. And we'll focus on a very particular example where Y is a smooth projective cubic surface and D is a triangle of lines on Y. In this case, there is a paper of last year of Gross, I can kill Zibert, which gives some explicit description of the mirror as a family of cubic surfaces. And essentially what we'll do is some iogenous version of their computation. And the result will be that the resulting non commutative algebra is a so-called skyline algebra of the four punctured sphere. So some associative algebra originally defined in the context of low dimensional topology. And as an application, we'll prove result about this particular scan algebra, which were previously conjectured by topologists, so that there's some positivity property for a particular basis of this algebra. So there is a conjecture by Dylan Thurston about general scan algebra that will prove in a special case of the four puncture sphere, and which in fact for the four puncture sphere as a refinement proposed by Bakshi, Mukherjee, Pristiki, Silvero, and Wong. So my plan is essentially in the first part of the talk to only start by explaining what these kind algebras are. So the first part of the talk will be elementary low dimensional topology. In some sense, there will be no mirror symmetry and no XYZ fabrication. So you should really think to this talk as being some kind of applied mirror symmetry talk. The first part will be exposition of a set of questions which naively has nothing to do with mirror symmetry, but that will solve using mirror symmetry inspired techniques such as scattering diagrams and broken lines. And at the end of the day, the proof will really rely on counting holomorphic curve in some Lagrangian torus vibrations. Okay, so I start with the elementary story. We'll talk about low dimensional topology. So we'll talk about knot and links. So a knot and a manifold is a connected compact embedded one dimensional submanifold 
a link is a disjoint union of finitely many nodes. And we'll need the notion of framing of a link, which is a choice of nowhere vanishing section of the normal bundle of the link, which equivalently is a choice of realization of each component of the link as a boundary of some, as some boundary component of some analysis. And some general theme in low dimensional topology is that once you have a manifold, you can look to all possible knots and links and cook up some algebraic structure out of them. And one such algebraic construction is a so-called Kaufman bracket scaling module, which I introduced by Pristik and Turaev at the end of the 80s. So if you give yourself some oriented three manifold M, then you consider all possible isotopic classes of frame link in your three manifold with coefficient over the base ring which will be the ring of Laurent polynomial with integer coefficients in a formal variable big A. So you start with a free module of all possible frame links, and then you divide by some relations, so-called scan relations. So in these diagrams, there is some implicit framing where the framing is so-called so vertical, so pointing towards you if you consider that the, well, the screen is horizontal. And uh, and so if you have three frame links, which looks like as on the picture, then uh, they are related in this kind of module by this relation. And the second relation tell you what to do if you have some unlinked and not component, you can remove it at the price of multiplying by some explicit polynomial, some explicit element in the base ring. Okay, so this thing is a definition of the Brass Kaufman bracket scan module of a three manifold, you take all possible links, take free module and you define and you divide by quite simple looking relations. So for example, if you look to the scan module of R3, it's possible to show that it is simply the of dimension one over the base ring, it's the base ring itself. So if you take the class of a frame link in the Kaufman bracket scan module, it is just an element of the base ring, so it's just a Laurent polynomial, and it is a so-called Kaufman bracket polynomial of the frame link which is essentially equivalent to the maybe more famous Jones polynomial. But essentially, historically, Jones defined this polynomial for length in R3, and Kaufman introduced a variant of the Jones polynomial, the Kaufman bracket polynomial for length in R3, and then the Kaufman bracket scan module, you can think about it as some generalization from R3 to marginal 3 manifold. Now, if you consider a three manifold, which has a particular form, which is a product of a two manifold by some interval, then your scan module has an extra structure. It has an algebra structure, because if you consider two frame links, L1 and L2 in your surface cross interval, you can essentially define a new link by putting L1 on top of L2. So more precisely, up to isotopy, you can assume that your L2 is inside surface cross minus one zero, up to isotopy, you can assume L1 is inside surface cross 0, 1. And then you define the product of L1, L2 as being the frame linked, which is simply the union of these L1 and L2. In this way, you get a product which is obviously associative, but which is non-cumulative in general. And so you get the thing called a scan algebra of the surface, which again is constructed from links into the surface cross interval. So we'll consider the case where the surface is a complement of finitely many points in a compact surface of genus G. And in this case, there is a nice basis of the scaling module, which is called the basis of multi-curve. So a multi-curve on a surface is a collection of finitely many disjoint, compact, connected, embedded, one-dimensional submanifold on your surface. So it's just a collection of finitely many non-intersecting curves drawn in your surface. So is that none of them bounce a disk in the surface. And if you view the surface inside the surface of interval, then the multi-curve defines a link in the corresponding three manifold. And in fact, it defines naturally a frame link because you can take the framing which is parallel to the third interval direction. And some theorem due to Pristiki tell you that isotopic classes of multi-curves form a basis of a scan algebra as a module over the base three. So if you think about this, you think it's some kind of generalization of the result saying this kind module of R3 is of dimension one over the base ring, because in this case, there is no non-trivial multi-curve. And essentially the proof of this result is quite natural. It's clear that the scan module cannot be bigger than the set of multi-curves 
because if you have frame link in a surface cross interval, by isotopy, you can retra retract near the surface and then use the first kind of relation to eliminate all crossing for the curve on the surface and you get some multi-curve. What is not completely obvious is that there is no extra relation between these multi-curves. Okay, so I introduced these scan module and scan algebras uh, as, as being about topology of three manifolds. But in fact, scan algebras are related to much more classical topics in algebraic geometry. They are related to character varieties. If you have a surface, topological surface, you can consider this SL2 character variety, which is looking at representation of the fundamental group of the surface into SL2 up to conjugation. And more precisely, the SL2 character variety is a affine variety that you get by taking the quotient in the sense of geometric invariance theory. So you look to the affine variety made of all group morphism from pi one to SL2. There is an action of SL2 by conjugation. And by definition, the ring of regular function on the SL2 character variety is a ring of invariant. And this is SL2 action. And given a multi-curve on your surface with connected components gamma one, gamma r, there is a corresponding regular function f gamma on the character variety. If you have a representation of pi one into SL2 rho, then you can apply rho on the multi-curve gamma j on the homotopy class of this curve. You get some element in SL2, you can take the trace, you get a number, and you get the and then you take the product of all these numbers of all possible connected components, you get a number. And there is a general theorem which tells you that. The scan algebra, which in general is a non-commutative algebra, is a deformation of the commutative algebra of regular function on the SL2 character variety. More precisely, if you set the variable big A to the value minus one, then the map sending a multi-curve gamma to the corresponding product of trace function F gamma on the character variety, it is a ring isomorphism. So here is some Quick example, if you look to the closed torus, you can show that isotopic classes of multicurves are in bijection with this set B of Z, which are pair of integers up to a global sign. Essentially, a multicurve is not oriented, so it has only a homology class up to a sign, and this homology class up to a sign is exactly an element in this set B of Z. So for every P, equal a pair of integers m and n in bz is the corresponding isotopic class of multicurves. And it's easy to check that this multicurve has GCD of m n connected components. And so in these examples, the general result tell you that this collection of element gamma p parameterized by c set b of z is a linear basis of the scan algebra of the closed torus. Okay, so the general topic about these kind algebras that we'll consider is a topic of positive basis. So first, if you have a, very generally speaking, if you have basis, a linear basis of an algebra, then you can define the so-called structure constant with respect to this basis, which are elements in the base ring. You simply take two elements in the basis, you take the product, and you expand the resulting element over the basis, and the coefficient of the expansion are called structure constants. And in the case of scan algebras, the base ring is the ring of Laurent polynomial with integer coefficients and uh, in the variable big A. And so we'll say that the basis of scan algebra is positive is a structure constant, so which are a priori a Laurent polynomial with integer coefficients. In fact, a Laurent polynomial with non-negative integer coefficients. And a natural question that you can ask is, can you find a positive basis in a scan algebra? And so then the first question, because I explained that you have the basis of multi-curve, multi which is a natural basis, you can ask, is the basis of multi-curve positive? And here maybe a general comment why you might want to care about this kind of positivity question. So in general, these positive questions are indication, are indication of like a deeper algebraic structure. If you have something positive, you might want to interpret it as dimension of a vector space, for example. So it's known that the Jones polynomial has some categorification given by Kovana homology. 
and their corresponding conjectural result about categorification of scanned algebras. And uh, so if you find a nice basis which has positive property, you would expect this basis to admit nice categorifications. Okay, but for, 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 for the purpose of this talk, we'll simply take this positivity property as a nice property that you might want to ask. And so as I say, you can first test the simplest basis that you have, which is the basis of multi-curves. And so you can look to the simplest example, the case of the closed torus. So just some example, you can compute gamma one zero times gamma zero one. So you take one curve in the homology class one zero, one curve in the homology class zero one, and they intersect in one point, and applying the scan relation one time to resolve the crossing, and you get what I wrote. And here in this expression, there are only plus signs, so here everything is positive. But if you do essentially the next example, take a curve of class 0, 1 times a curve of class 2, 1. So these two curves have, have two intersection points. Then you need to apply twice this kind of relation to resolve all intersection points. You find the right hand side that I wrote, and there are minus signs. So the basis of multi curve is not positive in general. And so well, the point is that there is a beta basis called the breasted basis, which is expected to have better positivity properties. And to define it, you need a little bit of algebra. You need to introduce the Chebyshev polynomials T and of X, which are defined by T0 equal one, T1 equal X, and T2 equal X squared minus two, and Tn plus one equal X, Tn minus Tn minus one. They are exactly the polynomial such that if you write X equal lambda plus lambda inverse, then Tn is lambda to the n plus lambda to the minus n. And essentially, we, we use these polynomials to twist the basis of multi curves. Or precisely, if you have some multi curve gamma, you can uniquely write it as gamma 1 to the n1 dot 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 times gamma r to the nr. So you look to all possible, all connected components of gamma, and one of them have the class of the connecting multi curve gamma 1. And all of them are the class of the connecting multiple multi-curve gamma R. Okay, so there is a unique way to just write gamma as in such a form. And then you define T of gamma as being the polynomial T N1 applied to gamma one, dot 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 times T N R applied to gamma R. So you see if T N of X were just the polynomial X to the N, this operation T of gamma will do nothing. T of gamma would just be equal to gamma. But because Tn of x is x to the n plus subleading terms, this T of gamma is not equal to gamma. It is a correction to gamma. And the collection of all this T of gamma when gamma describes a set of multicurve is a so-called braced basis of the scan algebra. So you can just, yeah, here just some comment. If you go in the classical limit, if you go to the character variety, Applying Tn of gamma to a connecting multicurve is just looking to the function minus trace of rho to the n. And maybe I will skip that. So if you just look to our example of the closed torus, where we had minus signs, it is a simple exercise to check that because there are minus signs is a, in the expression of Chebyshev polynomial T2 is x squared minus two, that in this simple, simple example, somehow if you express everything in terms of Chebyshev polynomials, all minus signs disappear in the final result. And in fact, there is a general conjecture due to Dylan Thurston, which predicts that his breasted basis should be positive in general for any surface. And as evidence for this conjecture, there is this theorem of Dylan Thurston, which is that if you set A equal to one, then it's true. So in this limit, the Laurent polynomial in big A simply become integers, and the theorem is that these integers are indeed non-negative. And the other piece of evidence for this conjecture is a case of the closed torus, which was proved that from an Gekla, some explicit formula for the product of element of the breasted basis in the case of the closed torus, which is a formula that we saw in some example before. And in fact, the claim is that it's true in general. So maybe some comment is that already this kind of theorem is quite non-trivial. So if you think about what it means, it, it means take two curves on the closed torus, 
these two curves can have many, many intersection points. So if you want to compute the product in the scan algebra, you need to apply the scan relations many, many, many times. And you will get many, many, many terms. But the statement is that if you write everything in terms of a Chebyshev polynomial, then the product of two elements simply reduced to the sum of two elements. So already proving this theorem is not obvious at all. It requires some work. Finally, let me comment that the case of a sphere, closed sphere or sphere minus one or two or three points are essentially obvious. In this case, the scalar algebra is positive, is commutative and these cases are essentially obvious. And so the main result of this talk will be that the conjecture is true. So the braced basis are positive in two special cases, the case of a four puncture sphere and the case of a one puncture torus, which were essentially the next case before what was known before, after what was known before. And unlike the case of the closed torus, it does not seem to exist a simple closed formula for the structure constants of the braced basis in these cases. So it does not seem to be reasonable to just write a closed formula and then just looking to the closed formula, see that the answer is positive. In fact, so, so topologies did this kind of exercise before to just do explicit computation in the scan algebra of the four function sphere, and you get more and more complicated looking formulas. So in fact, the case of the one puncture sphere follows more or less, sorry, the case of the one puncture torus follows more or less from the case of the four puncture sphere. So I will focus on this case. And I will end the first part of this talk by a more precise statement of the main result about the four puncture sphere. So on the four puncture sphere, there is four particular curves. You can look to AI, which is simply a small curve around one of the puncture. There are the so-called peripheral curves. And these curves are in the center of the scan algebra. And because of that, you can use scan algebra as a module over the bigger ring R, where you have included all the peripheral curves A1, A2, A3, A4 into the base ring. So some of these curves around puncture are like not very interesting curves. And the curves which are interesting are the ones which do not have any such components. And it's possible to show that isotopic classes of such curves of the interesting one are in bijection with the set B of Z, which already appeared, which is a set of pair of integers up to a global sign. And the reason why the same set B of Z appear for the four puncture sphere while before I was talking about the closed torus is because there is a simple topological relation that uh, a torus is a double cover of a sphere ramified at four points. So you, have a, you can exploit this topological relation to explain why the same set B of Z parameterize isotopic classes of multicurves on torus and isotopic classes of interesting multicurves on the four puncture sphere. And some of these interesting multicurves form a basis of scan algebra over the bigger ring, big R. And now you can define structure constants over inside this bigger ring. Well, now everything is parameterized by C set B of Z. And now the more precise version of the conjecture involve just explicit polynomials into the base ring. So L10, L01, L11, and Y. And then the precise version of this theorem tells you that the structure constant live inside this ring. They are polynomial with non-negative coefficients in the variable big A, but the dependence in the peripheral variable small a i is entirely through this polynomial L10, L01, L11, and Y. And this result was conjecture. So this precise result was conjecture by Bakshi Mukherjee, Pristiki, Silvio, and Wang. And in fact, this result implies the positivity of a breasted basis in the previous sense that I talked about before. Okay, so this thing is a kind of main result. So we have this topologically defined scan algebra of the four puncture sphere. You define a particular basis of it, this T of gamma P. You look to the structure constant, and then the prediction is that, and the result is that this so the constants have some remarkable positive property. Okay, so at the level of the statement, this thing has nothing to do with mirror symmetry or SYZ vibrations. Uh, 
let me just skip that. But some of the proof will rely on mirror symmetry and S was type IDs. It will relies on an algorithm explicitly computing these structure constants. And this algorithm will be a scattering diagrams. More precisely, will involve broken lines in a scattering diagrams. And so some of the points will be to identify this kind of algebra of the four function sphere as an output of some quantum mirror construction and to identify this particular breast basis to the so-called basis of theta function, which naturally come in the quantum mirror construction. And once you have such identification, we will have some algorithm to compute the structure constant, which is the algorithm provided by the consideration of broken lines. And if you have some well enough understanding of the relevant scattering diagram, and in particular relevant positive property, you will be able to prove relevant positivity of the broken lines and ultimately positivity property of these structure constants. So maybe I will end the first part there. So the first part was mainly some low dimensional topology and in the second part of the talk there will be more mirror symmetry related things. I guess Dan, you're muted. Yeah, yeah sorry, I, I caught myself. Um, so first, are there any um, official questions that people have um, that they want to ask uh, for posterity? Uh, hello, can I ask a question? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So uh, for the positivity property, do you deduce it from uh, like counts of uh, higher genus curves. I want, because I think these counts are virtual counts. Yeah, um, that's why. So, so, so yeah, the positivity will not be a formal consequence of the enumerative construction. It will follow from some explicit computation in this example. So essentially in this I example, see. See what I'm talking about in this talk is just an explicit example. And in this explicit example, you can compute everything and you will get some, uh, positivity. I see. So uh, where do we really use the interpretation uh, from the higher genus counts? Yeah, so I will explain that in the second part of the talk, not yet. Okay, thank you. I, I mean, maybe I can say it. It will be to guarantee that, to know that your scattering diagram is consistent. Because I will describe an explicit scattering diagram, but the only no I know to prove that it's consistent is that it's come from some enumerative geometry uh, description. We cannot uh, just uh, construct uh, this scattering diagram by the algorithm. Y y y y I mean, you can construct it by the algorithm. But you need to prove that the result of the algorithm agree with the final answer I will uh, present. And this thing requires some non trivial work. I mean, maybe you can do that, but I don't know how to do it directly. I see. I see. Thank you. Any other official questions? Seems not, so I'm going to pause the recording and we can ask our unofficial questions. Okay, so I said the point of the result we want to prove about the scan algebra of the four point sphere will be to realize this scan algebra as an output of some iogenous mirror symmetry construction. And first I will describe, I guess, almost all the things that you can do without doing geometry. So I will present the algorithm which compute everything you like to know about this kind of algebra, which obviously is mirror symmetry inspired. It would be scattering diagrams in broken line, but you can define this object just in an explicit and combinatorial way. And you will need the geometric input only for one statement. So for now, I will start by the combinatorics 
and algebra of scattering diagrams and broken lines in the very particular case we care about. So, so in the talks of yesterday, we had some examples of integral affine manifolds and scattering diagrams drawn on them. And so the, in the example, which will be relevant for us, the integral affine manifold B will be the quotient of R2 by plus minus one. And uh, so the set B of Z, which was parameterizing the interesting multicurves, so in particular, which will be indexing the basis we care about, are really integral points in this integral affine manifold. And uh, so you should think to this integral affine manifold as having a singularity at the origin. You can really think about it as being the upper half plane where you identify the left, let's say the positive x axis with the negative x axis. So there is an order two monodromy around the origin. And in this context, the scattering diagram is a choice of power series attached to every ray in B starting from the origin and having a rational slope. So such a ray has some primitive slope, Mn, and you want your power series, Fmn, to be a power series in the variable z to the minus Mn. So for every direction, you have a corresponding formal variable, and then you consider powers of this variable, and coefficients being in your base ring. So at this point, the scattering diagram is just a collection of countably many power series, and you think about them as being attached to rays in the upper half plane. And once you have such data, you can talk about broken lines. So a broken line has some asymptotic direction P, which is such in, in some integral point in B of Z, and some endpoint Q, which is a point in your upper half plane. And it is a continuous pathwise integral affine line, which bends along rays with rational slopes and which is decorated by monomials. So here is just some picture in red. You have some continuous paths made of two linear domain. And on each linear domain, there is a monomial living on it. And as for the function attached to the rays, the power of this monomial should be proportional to the direction of the line. And then there can be a coefficient in front of this power. And the last condition is that the monomial attached to the unbounded part of the broken line should have the monomial with coefficient one. So simply that to the minus p is a symptotic direction is p. So you have a collection of finitely many linear domains. So the curve bends along rays of rational slopes. Each linear domain is decorated by some coefficient times a monomial. The asymptotic monomial is fixed. And finally, there is a rule telling you a compatibility condition at the bending between the monomial before and after the bending. So here are also drawing. So if you have a broken line, which goes between the domains of linearity L and L prime, and which bends between the ray generated by M and N, primitive, then if I look to ML, the monomial attached to the linearity domain L, and ML prime, the monomial attached to the linearity domain L prime, then there is a relation between them more precisely, if you look to the power series attached to the ray where the broken line is bending, then given these power series, you do something. You essentially take a power of it and you expand it in monomials. And essentially, the monomial after the bending has to be the product of the monomial before the bending by one of the monomials appearing in this expression. So maybe it looks slightly com complicated, but it's a completely explicit rule. When you have a broken line coming in at some ray, you apply this recipe to know what are the possible monomials attached to the broken line on the other side of the ray. 
and maybe I should say here what I'm describing are really so-called maybe should be called quantum scattering diagram and quantum broken line. There is a variable big A appearing here. And if you set big A equal to one, this thing simply becomes the power of the function attached to the ray. And it maybe looks like a more familiar wall crossing formula. But we we'll need this kind of quantum version which involves this formal variable big A in the recipe. Is there a geometric interpretation of what this power of A and this exponent mean? So, so later in the so-called quantum mirror constructions, this variable big A will have some meaning and will be related to the genus expansion. And uh, so the only thing that I really understand geometrically is more is this kind of higher genus version of the Maslow index zero disk. And here what I'm describing is some kind of wall crossing transformation for the higher genus analog of the, let's say, wall crossing of Maslow index two disk. And I don't know a fully geometrical description of such a thing. But so some of what I wrote is some of the prediction for what such a thing should be. Okay, thank you. And so in particular in the traditional genus zero formula, there will be some kind of intersection number between the class of the boundary of the mass of index zero disk and the class of the mass of index two disk, so which is simply some integer. And in the IOGN story, this integer should be promoted to some kind of Q integer or big A integer. Where again, the variable big A, as I will see in one moment, is something like exponential h bar, where h bar is some genus counting parameter. Also, oh, should I imagine maybe that this might relate to counting higher genus multiple covers of a disk, or is that just a fantasy? So, so certainly, higher genus multiple covers of the disk are part of the story and part of where this variable big A is there. So, yeah, certainly. But I think there is something more complicated when you glue the two things, I guess something more complicated than just multiple cover appears. But indeed you have at least contribution of multiple covers. So yeah, we'll see more geometry at the end. At this point, it is simply a, just a algebraic recipe. Okay, so here the picture. So here I draw two broken lines having a common endpoint there. And I draw this particular kind of picture because once you have broken lines, you can use them to define things which look like such a constants of an algebra. If you have three elements, P1, P2, and P, in your set B of Z, and if you take a point Q, which is close enough to the point P, then you can define something which look like a structure constant CP1, P2, P, which is obtained by summing over all possible pairs of broken lines, ending at the point Q, so gamma one, gamma two, where gamma one has asymptotic direction P1, gamma two has asymptotic direction P2. So maybe on this picture, let's say this thing is gamma one, this direction here is P1, here you have a broken line gamma two, this direction is P2. These two lines end at the same point Q, which is really close to P. And then you look to what are the broken line close to the meeting point. They are labeled by some monomial C gamma one to Z to some power and C gamma two Z to some power. And then you define the contribution of this pair of broken line to your circuit constant that brings the product of this final monomial attached to your broken line, everything being again twisted by the power of big A. So in the classical story where big A is equal to one, you don't have this extra term. And this thing is symmetric in the two broken line gamma one, gamma two. And so this expression is symmetric in P1 and P2. But here you twist the story by this power of big A, which involves a determinant between the two final direction of the broken lines. And because the determinant is Q symmetric, if you sweep, if you sweep gamma one and gamma two, 
this expression in general will not be symmetric in P1 and P2. Okay, so again, forgetting the details, what we need to remember is that given some like, data of a scattering diagram, you have a notion of broken lines and you can use this broken line to cook up this object in a completely algebraic way. And then I would say that this scattering diagram is consistent if these objects which look like structure constant are really structure constants. So first of all, you want these objects to be independent of the choice of this final point Q. And then you want that if you define a product on the free R module indexed by these points in B of Z, and if you took set of, if you call set of P the generator attached to P, you can define a product theta P1, theta P2 by summing over P and using as coefficients the object CP1, P2, P defined previously using broken line. And you want this product to be associative. And some of the claim is that if you take a scattering diagram made of random power series, and if you try to define a product like that, it will not be associative. So it's a strong condition, it's a strong consistency condition on your set of power series so the resulting product is associative. And now to prove the result you want about the scan algebra of the four point three, you just have to guess a correct consistent scattering diagram. And then construct as a morphism between the resulting associative algebra and the scan algebra, which maps the basis of theta functions. So by definition, the algebra attached to the scattering diagram always comes with a natural basis because you define the product in, you start with the free module and then define the product in terms of structure constant. So you want your isomorphism to map this element theta p on the particular basis of the scan algebra that you care about, this basis of this bracet basis. And then once you can do that, it means that you have a formula to compute the structure constant. I mean, the formula in terms of broken lines. So if you know some positive property of the scattering, you will get positive property of the broken line and you will get positive property for these structure constants. So what I will describe next is some explicit scattering. And the claim will be that this explicit scattering is consistent and the resulting algebra coincide with this kind of algebra. And here is an explicit scattering diagram. It will be explicit, so there will be formulas. Here is some explicit rational function in some number of variables. Here I recall these elements L10, L01, L11, and Y in the best ring. And then our scattering diagram. So you need to give yourself for every rational slope, you need to give yourself a power series. So for every MNN primitive pair of integer, you need to give yourself a power series. And the claim is that essentially the, res the resulting series will only depend on MNN modulo two. So if MNN is equal to one zero modulo two, so if M is odd and N is even, then you look to the power series FMN, which is obtained by plugging into the explicit power rational function I wrote. So you replace the variable R and S by L10 and L01 and L11, and you replace X by the correct power of Z, Z to the power minus the direction minus M. So it's a completely explicit thing so it's a rational function. So when I say power series, it means you need to expand this rational function as a power series in X. And then if MN is zero one or one one mod two, then you just get, you just do some cyclic permutations of this variable L one zero, L zero one, L one one. Okay, so this thing is some completely explicit thing. I gave you some countable family of power series, which essentially are all constructed from some explicit rational function. And the point is that this rational function has some positivity property. 
if you, you know, in denominator, you always have something like one over one minus something. So when you expand, you always have one plus something. So, 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 there, are, so there is some non-short positivity in this particular rational function, which is ultimately the positivity which will matter. And now what we want to know is first that this scattering diagram is consistent. And then once you know this scattering diagram is consistent, it makes sense to, to look at the corresponding associative algebra constructing from broken line. And you want to show that there is some isomorphism between this algebra and the scan algebra you care about, mapping the, this basis of theta function into the basis you care about. And as, uh, as I, I, I alluded to in the questions, this theorem two will be mainly computationally proved by comparison of presentation of generators and relation and identification of PSL2 Z symmetries on both sides. And uh, maybe I will say, yeah, in fact, for the rest of this talk, I will not say more about it. I could say more about it in these questions. So, so where the geometry enters in what I did is to prove theorem one. How do I prove that these explicit scattering diagrams that are wrote down, how do you show that it's consistent? Or you could phrase the question differently. Maybe you have a different way to predict what the expected scattering should be, for example, you know the expected quantum cluster scattering diagram, so with explicit initial walls, but the question is how do you prove that the result of applying the algorithm producing the consistent scattering diagram, why is it producing exactly the answer which is written on C smart? And uh, so the proof of that will use enumerative geometry. So here, finally, is mirror symmetry. So the scan algebra is a four parameters families of non-commutative cubic surfaces. So this thing follow from some explicit presentation by generators and relation of scan algebras. And in fact, it's a non-commutative deformation of a four parameter families of affine cubic surfaces. And in fact, this particular four parameters families of affine cubic surfaces has been realized as a mirror family of a log Calabio surface YD, where Y is a smooth projective cubic surface, and D is a triangle of lines on this cubic surface. So, so here the claim is that if you apply the general growth, I can kill mirror symmetry construction for log Calabio surface. In this particular example, it was shown by growth, I can kill and Zebert, that you get some explicit four parameters families of affine cubic surfaces. And the construction of these mirror is in terms of scattering diagrams, constructing in terms of general zero log gram of return variance of YD. So exact, um, exactly the, scatter, the canonical scattering diagrams which appeared in the talks of yesterday. And what we'll do is this quantum mirror construction, which construct a deformation quantization of the mirror family of growth I can kill using higher genus log gram of return variance of YD. So if you want, there is a higher genus deformation of the canonical scattering diagram. And this, higher gen and this deformation produce a non commutative version of the mirror. So I guess here what I'm trying to say is that it was known that the scan algebra is a non commutative version of the family of cubic surface. It was known that the family of cubic surface is a mirror of some cubic surface. And then I have this construction of deforming the mirror construction to get another non-commutative version of the family of cubic surface. And then it's very natural to guess the scan algebra and this, and this non-commutative deformation given by iogenous mirror symmetry should agree, or at least you should be able to compare them. So here is some geometry about cubic surfaces. So you start with Y, a smooth projective cubic surface in P3. And it's classically known that Y contains 27 lines and that there are 45 triangle configuration of lines, by which I mean three lines intersecting as on a triangle. And if you fix a tr triangle D with components D1, D2, D3, then the divisor D is anti-canonical, and so the pair YD is a log Calabria surface. 
And now starting with this log Calabio surface, we'll construct a, let's say, higher genus or quantum version of the canonical scattering diagram. So first of all, as in yesterday's talk, B is realized geometrically as a dual intersection complex of the cubic surface. So D has three components, so there is three double points. So when you construct the dual intersection complex, you have three cones, and then you define the integral of one structure by asking it to look like toric across rays, and because the three lines are all minus one curves, and in toric geometry, if you have a minus one toric divisor, it is a sum of the adjacent rays. So if you start with a cone here, which is n squared, if you want this ray to be the sum of this ray and something else, the other ray has to be there. And if you want this ray to be the sum of this ray and something else, you get this thing. And obviously, because everything is, the pair is not toric, these three cones do not fit in R2, and you need to glue this ray with this ray to get the full integral affine manifold, and there is a singularity at the origin. And again, as in yesterday's talk, we said B of Z of integral points parameterize tendency conditions for curves in YD. If you have a point on one of these array, which is K times primitive generator of this array, you can think to that as specifying the fact that you have a curve in YD meeting the boundary, div boundary divisor corresponding to this array with multiplicity K. And if you have some point AB inside this two-dimensional cone, you can interpret this data as specifying a condition for a curve to go into the point, the corner of the triangle dual to this cone and being tangent to the two sides of the triangle meeting at this corner with contact order A and B. And now if you give, fix yourself a genus, beta a curve class, and V such point in B of Z, so some contact order, you can define some count NGV of beta, which precisely will be some log of which invariance counting genus G stable maps to YD of class beta with contact order V with D. And if you look to this immersive problem into the surface, this genus G problem has some expected dimension equal to G, and to get a number, you need to make on some specific insertion in your gram of written definition. Or maybe some more conceptual thing that you can do is to consider three-dimensional geometry of the top y time trivial third direction, and then you get some kind of Calabio 3 situation. And in a Calabio 3 situation, the virtual dimension is zero for any genus. And then you can use this definition to define your higher genus count. You can think of this insertion as making some difference between the obstruction theory of the threefold and the insertion of the surface. But in first approximation, these numbers are counting just G holomorphic curves in Y of class beta intersecting D in a single point. And so in the same way that in the genus zero case, you think to this number as some algebra geometric version of counts of mass of index zero holomorphic disk with boundary on some XYZ torus fiber you think to this about this number as some algebra geometric version of higher genus version of these curves with boundary on Lagrangian torus fibers. And now in the same way that if you take genus zero invariance, you can construct a canonical scattering diagram using formula, which I written yesterday, so as some exponential of some power series, there is a corresponding generalization in dimension two of this formula, which take into account all genus invariants, which is written here. So the series Fmn attached to a ray of direction Mn, it's an exponential of the power series where you sum all possible invariants having contact order with the divisor being a multiple of the point Mn. So here there is a variable t to the beta, which remember the curve class. There is some variable z, which remember the contact order. And now, with respect to the genus zero story, there is a new variable h bar, which remember the genus. And here there is this slightly strange factor, two sine k h bar over two. And, uh, and I will not explain why this factor is there, but it's kind of related to Denise's question about why this kind of factor should be there. And, and let me just keep that. 
So, so, so in, if you remember the canonical scattering diagram in J0, there is a factor k. So indeed, if edge bar goes to zero, the leading part of that is just k. And the claim is that in the higher genus story, this k should be replaced by this sign expression. And now some of the general quantum mirror story tell you that this kind of scattering diagram, so essentially for any log collaborator surface, this kind of scattering diagram defined in terms of this iogenous kind of curve is always consistent. And uh, the genus zero limit, it is what was shown by Grosek and Kill. And the proof of the genus zero rely on the so-called tropical vertex paper by Grossman and Monet Zebert. And, uh, and essentially in this quantum mirror story, you have some iogenous version of this story. And I will not go into this story in any details here. The only thing you should know is that there is this kind of geometrically defined scattering diagram. And somehow it, it follows, maybe in a not so simple way, but it follows from this geometric definition that this, this kind of scattering diagram is always consistent. So what remains to show is that after explicit specializations and identification of variables, this scattering diagram defined in terms of count of curves, starting from cubic surface and shown off lines, in fact, is the same as explicit scattering diagrams I wrote down. And again, the genus zero case was treated by Grossack and Kate Zebert. And so I will just end by some indication of how to do this hydrogenous version of the computation. So for example, assume you want to compute the power series F10. So you need to look at curve in your cubic surfaces, in your cubic surface intersecting the line D1 in a single point and not intersecting D2 and D3. So as an example of such a curve, there are some lines. So on the cubic surface, there is 27 lines. Already three of them form the boundary of the triangle. So there remains 24 lines, which are not contained in the boundary. And you can show that exactly eight of them intersect the side of the triangle. So there is exactly eight line intersecting the side D1 of the triangle, and they all intersect with contact order one. There are other kind of curves which intersect D1 in a single point and do not intersect D2 and D3. There are two curves of class D2 plus D3 intersecting D1 with contact order two. And geometrically, if you think about your cubic as being constructed starting with P2 in a triangle of line, and if you blow up two points on each side of the chunk of line, so you get P2 blow up in six points, which would be your cubic. And if you start with a conic in P2, passing through four of the points that you will blow up and tangent to one given line, then the strict transform of these two conics will be exactly the curves I'm talking about here, which have contact order two with D1. And now the statement is that the power series F10 as his explicit form. Well, now I finally arrived to the relation between this variable big A, which was in the scan algebra story and my explicit scattering description, and the edge bar relation, which is a ex genus expansion parameter in Grom of Wheaton theory, and the relation is his exponential kind of relation. Big A to the four is equal to exponential E edge bar. And in fact, in this explicit formula, the numerator comes entirely from multiple covers of the eight lines. And the denominators come entirely from multiple cover of these two strict transforms of the conics. And in fact, in the genus zero of gross and kill zebert it is already what happens. Here somehow we need to do the higher genus version of this computation, which is responsible for the, uh, the presence of these coefficient terms here, big A. And somehow to do the multiple cover computation of the lines is quite easy, but to do the iogenous multiple cover contribution of the strict transform of the conics is a bit more complicated, but you can do it. Okay, so here the claim is that the full enumerative geometry, if you only care about the ray of direction one zero, 
Socially, it comes from iogenous multiple covers of very explicit curves, which are this collection of L lines and this collection of two strict transform of conics. So here we have computed one ray, which maybe sounds an easy ray. Maybe it sounds like all the other rays, for example, correspond to curve going in the corners of the triangle with ion multiplicity, and maybe it sounds complicated. But here you can use a trick with was already used in genus zero by Gorosek and Hitzibet, which is that you can exploit some PSL2Z log birational symmetry group. So yeah, so what is FMN for general MN? In general, it, it looks complicated. For one zero, you have the explicit description we described before. For general MN, it looks complicated but we have some PSL2 that group of log birational automorphism of YD. So you have one generator S of PSL2Z, which does something just obvious, just cyclic permutation of D1, D2, D3. So this thing is like not very interesting, but you have some other generator T, which acts by blowing up one of the corner of the triangle and then contracting the opposite side of the triangle. And you can check that if you do that, you start with a cycle of minus one curve and you still get a cycle of minus one curves, which means if you start with a cubic surface with a triangle of line, after this birational transformation, you still get a cubic surface with a triangle of lines. And so this PSL2, that group is big enough so that if you care about the series FMN, where the curve, let's say, go into one of the corner of the triangle, if you do enough birational modification of the boundary, after enough birational modifications, your curve with contact order MN into a corner will simply become a curve going to a smooth point of a smooth divisor. And then you can apply the previous computation about F10, which is essentially why all the rays FMN for every MN, they are essentially all the same. If you remember my explicit description, of the scattering diagram, all the series FMN up to somewhat two dependence on MN, they are, they are all expressed in terms of the same universal par, uh, rational function. And the reason is this geometrical big PSL2Z symmetry. Yeah, and so you need to conclude using invariance of log gramophilia invariance and a log birational modification. So when you do that, so intuitively, if you think that you are counting open curve in the complement of y minus d, what we are doing here never touch the interior. So it should be clear that the number should not change. And in the framework of log of written invariance, this kind of transformation only modifying the boundary is part of the general theory that they do not change the numbers. So you can use this kind of trick to compute the numbers. So the upshot of this computation is that you can compute explicitly all the iogenous chromophyta invariants involved in the iogenous version of the canonical scattering diagram. And what we get is exactly the explicit scattering diagram that I wrote down. And then it's guaranteed by this geometric origin that this scattering diagram is consistent. And then I summarize previously, once you know that this thing is consistent, you look to the corresponding associative algebra and then you only need to do finitely many computations to identify generators relations, matching the PSL to Z action and matching everything that you want with what happens on the scan algebra side. And I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, um, let's let's thank Pierre. Um, are there any question, official questions people want to ask? No. Um, all right. I'll uh, I'll pause the recording and I'll, and people can ask their unofficial questions.